They call it the Forgotten McLaren. A car that was revolutionary, truly ahead of its time. Hobbies of the Forgotten McLaren include spontaneously catching on fire, spontaneously breaking in half, spontaneously losing wheels, spontaneously losing brakes. Boy, is it a story. But we can't talk about McLaren in the early 2000s without talking about Adrian Newey, one of the most successful aerodynamicists in Formula 1 history. One of the GOATs. But even Ted Williams had to strike out every now and then. It's all part of the game. We'll be talking a lot about Adrian Newey in this video because he, alongside Mike Coughlin and Neil Oatley, designed and helped bring to fruition one of the most infamous cars to ever compete in Formula 1. Except. It never did compete in Formula 1. Even with a near unlimited budget, unlimited testing, and some of the best engineers and aerodynamicists in Formula 1, the 2003 McLaren MP418, doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, does it, never actually competed in a race weekend. How is that possible? Did you know Adrian Newey and Jeremy Clarkson went to the same high school? The year is 1999, and Michael Schumacher has brought glory to Ferrari, playing a huge role in leading the team to their first Constructors' Trophy in almost 20 years. And then at the turn of the millennium in 2000, Ferrari would not only take home the Constructors again, but this time, Michael would hold the Drivers' Championship trophy in that famous red suit for the very first time. And again in 2001, and then again in 2002, and of course we know how the story goes, but before Ferrari was doing the winning, then who was? That's right, McLaren. In 1998, McLaren secured both championships in the hands of Mika Hakkinen and David Coulthard. It wasn't a slam dunk because Ferrari was on their tail the whole time, but still, McLaren were doing well, and they'd been doing pretty well for a while. Certainly not the McLaren that we know today. Damn it, Lando. Ignoring a bit of a dry spell from 1994 to 1996, they generally always had their nose up towards the front end of the grid, battling for wins and podiums in 90s F1 glory relatively often. But come 2000 and there's a new top dog in town. And McLaren needs to do something to have a chance to get back on the top going into the 2003 season. But more on that later, just bear with me on this. Despite Ferrari's somewhat dominant performance in 2000, 2001, and 2002, McLaren managed to stay at the top and push the Italian team to those Constructors' Championships. They didn't always make it easy for them. They stayed close but just weren't able to put together a complete package that could keep up with the V10-powered Ferrari. And it wasn't just those two teams battling for wins either, you also had a BMW-powered Williams in the mix right up there with McLaren. McLaren, the competition was fierce. It's also worth mentioning that in the early 2000s, while they might not have had the best chassis or the best engine, that would be the BMW being ran in the aforementioned Williams, they also didn't exactly have the strongest driver pairing either. Michael Schumacher was unstoppable and only getting better, only getting faster and more Schumacher-ish. Meanwhile, McLaren's star man, Mika Hakkinen, was kind of going in the opposite direction. We won't go into that too much, but the TLDR is that he had a couple of really big mechanical failures in the late 90s and early 2000s that seemed to have put a real damper on his motivation. He lost trust in his equipment in his 2002 sabbatical would eventually turn into a permanent retirement, which would allow young rookie and eventual 2007 champion Kimi Raikkonen to take his place. But still, even if McLaren did have a prime Mika or a prime Kimi or a prime David, the car was getting slower year after year and it was also getting less and less reliable. In 2001, McLaren had 10 retirements. In 2002, they would go on to have 14 retirements. They wrapped up third in the constructors in 2002, 156 points behind Ferrari and 27 points behind Williams with neither David or Kimi putting a real dent into Michael Schumacher's lead. 2002 was bad. They needed a silver bullet, they needed somebody who could think outside the box, and they had just the right man for the job. Adrian Newey started with McLaren in 1997 and immediately set off to work on the 1998 car, which would of course, as we just said, go on to win both titles that year for Mika Hakkinen and McLaren. Of course, the next year in 1999, Mika goes on to win it again, the team as a whole just barely losing out to Ferrari. But like we just discussed, following 98 and 99, the car just got progressively worse and worse, so when it came around to 2003, the team, led by Ron Dennis, decided that the only answer to Ferrari dominance was a complete revolution, not an evolution. In the past few videos, we covered the 2009 Ferrari F60 and the 2022 Mercedes W13, and what did these two cars have in common? Two dominant forces in the Formula 1 universe getting a new set of regulations wrong and not staying at the top during a huge change in Formula 1. But in 2003, there wasn't anything like that. Regulations stayed pretty much the same from 2001 and 2002, apart from some updated technical regulations. For example, 2003 saw the introduction of the Hans device to keep drivers' heads from flying all over the place in a high-speed impact. A one-lab qualifying format was introduced, which sucked. And most importantly, for a team like McLaren, and the point system was completely overhauled for the first time since 1991. And McLaren's plan going into the 2003 season would be to start off with an updated version of the car that they ran the year before in 2002, while they finish getting the MP418 ready to go so that it can start winning races and getting those big points. So when McLaren lined up for the first race of the 2003 season, the car that they actually brought was the MP417D, an updated version of the same car that they ran in 2002. And the updated 17D was actually really good. Now at the opening round in Australia, David Coulthard would qualify
qualify 11th, and Kimi Raikkonen did qualify 15th after he made an error, which wasn't fantastic. But it was this weird one-shot qualifying format, and the cars also qualified with race fuel loads, so they were really heavy. And with some bad weather on race day and a bit of luck, David Coulthart would actually go on to win the race. And Kimi finished third, so both McLarens on the podium, first race of the 2003 season, with an updated car that they were using from last year. Pretty good way to start the year. It was looking good for the silver cars, and it finally looked like Ferrari were going to have some real competition. It didn't just stop there, either. The stopgap car would actually give Kimi Raikkonen his debut win at the very next race in Malaysia. Unfortunately, though, as the season wore on, it became clear that the MP417D was reaching the limit of its development potential as other teams were making more and more progress with their cars, especially Ferrari, who were furiously developing the F2003, and it was working. Despite McLaren's strong start in the season, Michael Schumacher would go on to win the next three races after the Brazilian Grand Prix to put himself within just two points of Raikkonen in the Drivers' Championship and place Ferrari back ahead of McLaren in the Constructors' Championship. McLaren needed their new car, which Nui and Coughlin had been working on for quite a while at this point, and they needed it badly. It was going to be the only way to get back ahead of Ferrari, who could only make the F2003 faster, while the updated MP417D was pretty much capped. However, just three days after Schumacher had won the Austrian Grand Prix, his third win in the row, McLaren would finally release their new machines to the public, the MP418. The car looked very different from the MP417 that they had been running for two years now. The old car was boxy and angular, while the new 18 was sleek and smooth with sweeping curves and a modern look, and it was also technically very different from anything. The car featured very small side pods to help improve aerodynamics, and the exhausts exited out from under the gearbox and blew into the diffuser. It was revolutionary at the time. In fact, this was the same technology that Nui would later perfect with Red Bull during the 2010s, and again, we all know how that story goes, which is kind of a theme for the whole car, a lot of innovative, never-before-done ideas that, while they might not have worked out very well here in 2003, these same ideas would often resurface years later and turn out to be revolutionary, like the blown diffuser, like the gearbox, which we'll go over in a second. The car also featured a brand new Mercedes engine specifically designed to be located as low in the car as possible for the optimal center of gravity. And finally, the car also used a titanium composite gearbox, which was the first of its kind. This is a gearbox casing made with carbon fiber bonded to titanium parts, which made the gearbox much lighter. This was extremely difficult to do and made many people even question whether the gearbox would last race distances. But if the MP418 was supposed to start earlier in the year, why didn't it? Why are we so many races into the season and we still haven't seen it on track? Well, now we get into the problems. And there's a lot of problems. For starters, the MP418 had failed the FIA crash tests. Now, this wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't super uncommon. In fact, it's actually said by engineers on the grid even today that if a car doesn't fail its first couple of crash tests, then that usually means it's too heavy and that you're compromising on pace. Of course, as we'll discuss, you'll see why it never would have made it to the grid anyways, regardless of it had passed or not. Car couldn't withstand side impacts. Not good. By this point in the story, the MP418 has missed the first six rounds of the 2003 season when it was ready to make its first full testing session over a three-day period. McLaren test driver Alexander Warris Oh, no, I'm not saying that name right. He was going to be the one testing the car. This was back in the day when test drivers were actually useful, and Alexander had joined the team in 2000, hoping to take Mika Hakkinen to see it when he took his sabbatical, but McLaren gave that seat to Kimi instead. The three-day testing session was going to take place at Paul Ricard, and during its first time really running on track, it was actually very promising. On its very first outing, it was already lapping faster than the MP417D that the team had been racing with all year at this point, and the car was looking full of potential, but it didn't take long for the headaches to start for the team. Of all the issues it had, one of the biggest ones was overheating. The car would overheat, and burst into flames often. It was so common for the car to overheat and ignite that mechanics usually would be standing by with fire extinguishers every time the car rolled into the pit lane. The reason for the overheating was mainly down to the cooling package that it had because the location of the exhaust in the new, lower-mounted engine made it very difficult to keep everything cool. There just wasn't anywhere for the heat from the exhaust to escape to, and this meant that the car couldn't be run more than a couple of laps without severely overheating, prompting Nui to shelve the blown diffuser element of the car just after the first test and move the exhaust to a more conventional, higher location in an almost periscope-like fashion since that was the prevailing idea at the time. Okay, so the car had problems passing crash tests and had severe overheating problems. There's always a workaround and it doesn't sound like anything too crazy, right? Well, Claren had to push back the launch of the new car even more to redesign the exhaust and try and fix their heat problem, but by the time the car was ready for Alexander to test again, it was already mid-July and the team was hoping for a debut at the British Grand Prix. The next testing session would take place in Spain. It was at this testing session that the car would go from annoying to getting the unfortunate nickname for a race car, the Suicide Contraption. As the Austrian was going through the fast left-hander through turn four, the the floor of the car just suddenly collapsed without any warning whatsoever. Alexander was thankfully all right after the incident, but the team was never able to actually find out exactly what made the floor fail like it did. They couldn't find a reason or an explanation why it just suddenly collapsed. So at this point, not only were the drivers rightfully concerned with the safety and the structural integrity of the car itself, but the mechanics were sick of working on it 
too. Cars designed by Adrian Newey are notorious for being very difficult to work on. It's all about the performance and whether it's convenient or not to work on is completely irrelevant because all that matters is the results. And okay, sure, that works, but only to a point. The design of the entire car was so detailed and so complex that just a simple setup change would mean that the entire car had to be completely disassembled and reassembled again. The lower mounted engine made everything so difficult to get to and core components needed fixed or worked on. And they were working on it all the time because the MP418 really enjoyed catching on fire or disintegrating like we just discussed at a moment's notice. So it overheats and fails crash tests and splits in half sometimes and it's impossible to work on. Whatever. No big deal. What else? Well, McLaren were undeterred by this, which makes sense because their stopgap car was falling behind Ferrari more and more and the investment being made into the 18 was growing and growing. The team would go back to Paul Ricard in France for yet another testing session with Alexander behind the wheel and things wouldn't get any better somehow. He would go on in one testing session to have not one, not two, but three completely separate full brake failures. Thankfully, unlike the floor fiasco, McLaren did actually figure out why the brakes were failing as often as they were. And it turns out that due to the engine being located so low and everything being packed in so tight, when the engine would blow, it would just take everything else out with it. And because it was so prone to overheating from the bad cooling package and because everything was packed in so tight, it blew up a lot. This meant that every time the engine overheated and blew, Alexander's foot would just go straight to the floor because brake lines were getting torn to shreds along with everything else in the engine bay. Still, McLaren were not going to give up, especially with Kimi Raikkonen losing the championship lead to Michael Schumacher after the Canadian Grand Prix. For the next test, they decided to give their car to their actual race drivers, David and Kimi, to test. It would be the MP418's last chance to prove that it wasn't the suicide machine that the media was starting to say that it was. I would imagine that Alexander was pretty happy to be out of the MP418, seeing that it tried to kill him so many times. But, uh, wouldn't it be his last Last time. But by this point, it certainly didn't seem like the car was going to be the savior that McLaren needed so badly. But the test went on with David and Kimi. Michael was beginning to pull away with the championship by this point, point. McLaren was losing their chance to be able to bring a fight to Ferrari. The old car that they've been running was as fast as it could possibly be without risking reliability, and the F2003 was only getting faster. McLaren needed this car to work. They needed the investment to be worth something. They needed to get results. The team sent the MP418 to Catalonia in Spain to get the driver's inputs, and I'll keep this short. David Coulthard's test wasn't terrible. It didn't split in half, it didn't catch on fire, the brakes didn't fail, it seemed fine, maybe even good. But when Kimi was taking the car off for some laps and he was going through the very fast, at the time, final corner, he had an accident. We don't know much about it, nobody does besides the team and obviously Kimi himself, but the team blamed Kimi. And this obviously made him very upset. He swore up and down that he had nothing to do with the accident, that it wasn't his fault, but the team just stuck to the script and said that it was driver error. With the reputation the car was quickly building, many fans as well as those in the media were skeptical that it was actually Kimi's fault, especially because the final corner at Barcelona wasn't hard, it was just a normal corner. A corner that people take without incident all the time. But while we can never know exactly what happened with that accident that day, it certainly wasn't looking good for the car after what was supposed to be its final outing. By this point, everybody was waiting for the announcement that McLaren was putting the MP418 on the shelf to be completely forgotten about. It was getting too late in the season, they had made significant investment, put so much time and resources and work into making the car work the way that they believed it could and the way that they said that it would, but it just wasn't happening. And if it hadn't happened yet, then it probably just wasn't going to. Still, the team would give the car one last chance. At Silverstone, they put Alexander behind the wheel yet again to see what he could make of it. From his 2016 McLaren and Me article, and I quote, Then I had a day at Silverstone. Three times I lost the left front wheel in Beckett's and Maggots because the loads were so high that it opened up the wheel in the first left-hander, and in the second left-hander, the wheel completely fell off. Then I had a brake failure at a slow corner, which was good because I hopped across the gravel bed and grass to make it back. They repaired the car, said that we had to do one more run, and sent me out anyways. And in bridge corner, the rear suspension completely collapsed. I had a big impact, and the car was in two pieces again. I walked back to the garage, took out my phone, called the team boss and said, I'm sorry, I don't want to drive this car anymore. By that time, no race driver wanted to drive the car, and that was the last meter that the MP418 ever drove. It was over. That test in Silverstone was the nail in the coffin for the car that McLaren had put everything on. And you want to know something? When it was all said and done in 2003, Kimi would end up finishing only two points behind Michael Schumacher. Two points! They just put all the resources that they dumped into the 18 and instead put it on the 17D. They surely could have made up that difference and Kimi Raikkonen would be the 2003 champion. Surely they could have gotten just a little bit more out of that car. We're talking a two point difference. But these are things that we can never know and we're only left to speculate. What if the 18 was reliable? What if they had tried racing it in an official session? How would it stack up? Would the revolutionary transmission have held up? Probably not because that was also very prone to overheating, but still. The MP418 was confined to the pages of history, never having entered an official Formula 1 event, but still taking up one of McLaren's number designations, meaning that the brand new 2004 car would be named the MP419, making the MP418 the forgotten McLaren.